there any questions? And I give the call to the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, the Foreign Minister yesterday claimed that Israel, in carrying out its defensive war against terror group Hamas, is breaching international law and should undertake a ceasefire. Is this the government's position? Call to the Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, the transcript uh, of yesterday's interview said that she did not say that. What the Foreign Minister spoke about was perfectly consistent with the motion that was moved in this parliament that was supported by the opposition on the floor of this parliament, uh, that indeed uh, we uh, continue to support. I think it provides a principal way of moving forward. It provided for, uh, one, unequivocally condemns the attacks on Israel by Hamas. It asserted Israel's right to defend itself. It also called for the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages. It condemned anti-Semitism. It went on to say to recognise that Hamas does not represent the Palestinian people nor their needs and aspirations. It acknowledged the devastating well loss of Israeli and Palestinian life and the innocent civilians on all sides are suffering Order, the of the as a result of the attacks by Hamas and the subsequent conflict. It said, uh, that this parliament supports justice and freedom for Israelis and Palestinians alike. It said, which was backed up by the Foreign Minister yesterday, reiterates Australia's consistent position in all contexts is to call for Order. the protection of civilian lives. The Prime Minister will pause. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, on relevance, the question didn't relate to a motion before the House. It related to reckless comments by the Foreign Minister yesterday, and the question was, is this the government's position? Can the Prime Minister provide a straight answer? Order. Resume your seat. The Prime Minister was asked about the government's position. He is reading the government uh, uh, resolutions of the House. He's being relevant to the question, and he's also dealt with the issue of the comments being made in the question as well. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you. Uh, it reiterates Australia's consistent position in all contexts is to call for the protection of civilian lives and the observance of international law. Now, the opposition voted for that a few weeks ago. Is that now not their position? Is that not their position now? It acknowledged what has unfolded is deeply distressing Order. for many in the Australian community. It condemned all forms of hate speech. The position on the Middle East is a complex one and one that we know is causing great distress for Jewish Australians, for Palestinian Australians and for people uh, of uh, Islamic faith as well. Uh, we know that we have a responsibility to not seek to politicise these matters but to engage in a principled way going forward. I condemn unequivocally as well the decision by some to have a demonstration in Caulfield on Friday night, as I condemn unequivocally the decision to ride motorbikes through the eastern suburbs of Sydney. That sort of provocation, it is vital at this time that people in positions of leadership exercise exercise that leadership in a responsible way Order. and seek Prime to bring Minister's people time together. Has concluded. Give a call to the member for Jagger Jagger. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Government Services. How is the Albanese Labor government formally responding to the Royal Commission into the RoboDebt scheme, and how does this compare with other responses to the Royal Commission? Give a call to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme and the Minister for Australian Services. Thank you. Today, the Order. Albanese government has formally responded to all 56 recommendations of the RoboDebt Royal Commission. RoboDebt, as members of the House will know, was a cruel and crude mechanism. It was neither fair nor legal. It made many people feel like criminals. It was costly in both human and economic terms. So today the Albanese government says never again. Yeah. We've already ceased the use of debt collection agencies for Debt Recovery and Services Australia. We've stopped the reverse onus of proof. 
We have stopped treating people who use our social security safety net as second-class cheats. And last week we announced 3,000 new jobs in the front line of Services Australia to help people process their claims and calls. But we can say never again. But Australians can't have true robo-justice until the opposition join us in a full-throated apology. Now, to be fair, some in the opposition have shown courage. The member for Menzies said, as someone who is a Liberal and believes in the sanctity of the individual, due process and the presumption of innocence, it offended all of these. It was illiberal, it reversed the onus and it hurt people. The member for Flinders has said, it's now apparent that the expanded compliance system, now known as RoboDebt, is one of the poorest chapters in Australia's public policy history and one that sits at the feet of the coalition in its time of government. Senator Patterson said, it's incredibly regrettable, it should not have happened. We have to learn these lessons. It was a government that I was a member of and I really regret that it happened. But so far, the Leader of the Opposition has not taken the high road, as some of his colleagues had, but rather last August took the low road and accused the Royal Commission of morphing into a witch hunt. The victims of RoboDebt have noticed the truculent refusal, the deafening silence of a full-throated apology by the Leader of the Opposition. You cannot have justice for Australians, the promise that never again will it occur, when the potential alternative government doesn't own the problem. You cannot have justice for the victims unless there's a guarantee that it won't be repeated again and that the lessons have been learned. However, the Leader of the Opposition so far has given no sign of fully owning the disaster which was robo-debt. We all know the difference between a standard politician's apology, if you are offended, I'm sorry, and a real one. So it's time, Member for Dixon, it's time for a real apology today in the parliament, right here, right now. Copy your courageous backbenchers, own the sins of the coalition and stop airbrushing history. Yeah. Call to the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Order. Prime Minister. Yeah. Order. Members on my right. The Leader of the Opposition will begin his question again in silence. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Over the last 15 months, the cost of everything has gone up under this Prime Minister. The latest CPI data shows that food is up 8.2 per cent, housing costs 10.4 per cent, insurance is up 17.3 per cent, electricity up 18.2 per cent and gas is up by a massive 28 per cent. The Prime Minister has broken every promise made before the election and made poor decisions every day since. Why are Australians paying the price for a distracted and out-of-touch Prime Minister failing to focus on the real issues affecting Australians? Order. The Leader of the House will cease interjecting. The Prime Minister has the call. I thank the Leader of the Opposition uh, for his question once again, <laughs> showing that he has absolutely nothing positive to offer the Australian people. Absolutely nothing. Because Order. Order. there are three vital ways that we're tackling Order. cost of living. Getting costs members down for families, left, getting wages up for workers and getting the budget onto a stronger foundation. And on all of those measures, those opposite oppose everything positive that is put forward in this parliament. He has nothing positive to offer the country. He just says no to everything that is put forward, opposes change and can't, can't even lead, uh, lead his own party. Why, he can't even appoint a shadow minister for Stuart Robert, who resigned about five months ago, because he's hampered Order. by those people on his back bench. Now, despite the opposition of those opposite, we've delivered $23 billion in cost of living relief to Australians. $23 billion. Cheaper childcare, which began in July. More Medicare bulk billing that began just this month with a tripling Member for of Hume the bulk will billing incentive. Cheaper medicines on January 1, and then again the 60-day dispensing. This is the first question. This is the first question on cost of living we've had for them for months. For months. Jim Chalmers doesn't have to worry about not being here because he won't get a question as the Treasurer. 
We had the energy bill relief Order. Members on my that left. we put together with states and territories last year, opposed by those opposite. Fee-free TAFE training, over 220,000 places making a difference for free. The building more affordable homes, again opposed by those opposite. Just like they oppose our actions that have got wages growing at the fastest rate in a decade. Just like they opposed the pay rise for aged care workers of 15 per cent. Just like they said an increase in the minimum wage would Member lead to Barker the whole economy collapsing. We've created 550,000 jobs since we came to office. The more more jobs Order. created on our watch than under any first term government in Australia's history, and we're not even halfway through. And we did something those opposite never did. We turned a $78 billion deficit into a $22 billion Order. surplus. Order. There is far too much noise on my left. The member for Bowman, Barker, and Groom will cease interjecting. Call to the member for Aston. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. What did the Royal Commission find about the robo debt scheme, and how does this government, this government's approach to helping vulnerable Australians, differ? Give the call to the order. Give the call to the Prime Minister. I, I thank the member for Aston uh, for her question and uh, note, note that she's the best member for Aston we've had for some time yeah. in this place. And she Order. understands she understands that robo debt will stand forever as one of the worst policy failures by any Australian government. A deliberate policy to hound Australians, not an accident, not a mistake one that was accompanied by threats in this chamber to hunt people down to hunt people down and we know that it made an enormous difference uh, to so many Australians who were the most vulnerable and we know as well that in this chamber it was raised day after day week after week month after month year after year those opposite knew knew that it was an illegal scheme but it didn't stop them still pursuing some of the most vulnerable people in our society. A shocking abuse of trust that was exposed by the Royal Commission. People like Melanie Clee told the Royal Commission, she said this, I had to sell everything I could sell just a little to get by. I had to go to the Salvation Army for the first time ever in my life and it was quite degrading. It made me feel like I was a criminal I never want to deal with Centrelink ever again. This is the pathology of those opposite. The party of robo-debt, cutting the humans out of human services and replacing them with a system that sent people notices and threats for debts which they did not owe. Ripping the social justice out of social services. The same ideology that produced robo-debt still drives them today. The Leader of the Opposition has nothing positive to offer Australia. No plan, no solutions to the challenges facing the country. Just saying no and opposing change. Uh, we know that many people out there are doing it tough, which is why we have uh, the cost of living relief, including cheaper medicines, has saved $200 million on 17 million scripts in the first 10 months of this year. We have invested in affordable housing, including for women and children escaping domestic violence. We legislated energy bill relief for five million households. We invested in fee-free TAFE after a decade of cuts and neglects. To all of those measures they opposed, those opposite continue to show a total disregard for people who are doing it tough. Just punishment, blame and vindictiveness. They never stand, miss an opportunity to stand in the way of supporting those people Order. who Prime are Minister's the most time vulnerable. Has concluded. I give the call to the member for Calais. To the Prime Minister. 
Tomorrow, Yagara and the communities of the Central West will mark the first anniversary of the awful storm and flood tragedy of the 13th and 14th of November 2022. While our communities are grateful for the $100 million joint state and federal funding package, which was finally announced last week, we need assurances that this funding will be made available to residents on the ground, on the double. Prime Minister, will you give our communities this assurance? I the call to the Prime Minister. I, I thank the member for Clare uh, for his question. I certainly will give uh, his community, through the member for Clare, uh, that assurance. And I thank him for the representations that he's made on behalf of that community and for the fact that I was able to visit uh, that community in Yagara, along with uh, the then Premier, uh, Dominic Perrottet, as well. And we've worked through with the Minns government in New South Wales uh, support uh, for the Central West region. And uh, we have uh, promised through the Central West Recovery and Resilience Package, jointly funded, by the Commonwealth and New South Wales governments. It's comprised of $32 million for the Regional Transport Resilience Fund, uh, $25 million for the Community Assets Program, a $1 million for legal aid assistance, $2 million for the Central West Housing Consultation Program, and we have in principle agreement as well, in addition to that, for $40 million for the Central West Housing Program. Now, this funding is to help the New South Wales Central West region's recovery from these devastating floods, but also, importantly, to build resilience for the future. I remember uh, sitting in rooms some years ago uh, before uh, the former Labor government changed uh, the, the rules where you weren't allowed to build back better. And that makes no sense at all. It makes sense to actually take into account when a natural disaster occurs, and that's why we have that funding for the Regional Transport Resilience Fund is aimed at how do we build roads that don't just get washed away and therefore isolate communities uh, in the future. Uh, this package includes support for the repair and replacement of critical community assets, improving the resilience of public infrastructure as well as legal assistance. Uh, we've also got that in principle uh, support to match funding for a resilient housing program for the Central West. Now, these are important projects which will be overseen by a forum of community leaders and reps from both Commonwealth and state governments. And I know that the mayor uh, there is, uh, is a fine fellow uh, and uh, he will be involved as well. Uh, we are prioritising the most impacted local government areas of Cabone, uh, Parks, Forbes and Lachlan. I know this impacts on the member, member for Riverina's electorate as well, and I thank him uh, for the representation that he's made. And my government is determined to make sure that people aren't left behind uh, in those communities, and that's why we've acted in partnership with the New South Wales government. The call to the member for Paterson. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Home Affairs. The Nixon report found our migration system was broken, allowing the exploitation of some of the most vulnerable people in our society. What progress has the Albanese Labor government made in addressing these issues after a wasted decade? I give a call to the Minister for Home Affairs and the Minister for Cybersecurity. Thank you so much, Speaker. And could I thank the member for Patterson for her question? And she's absolutely right. What we saw is a decade of profound mismanagement of our migration system. And the consequence Order. of that is that some is incredibly vulnerable people were very, very badly hurt. Now, Speaker, uh, the Nixon report was received by the government and it made very damning findings about the migration compliance system that was set up and overseen by the Leader of the Opposition when he was in this portfolio. Uh, we have seen enormous damage result from the poor management of this system. And the member for Patterson, I know, is particularly concerned about violence and abuse that's perpetrated against women. And the Nixon report makes it very clear that women were predominantly the victims of the conduct that was uncovered. 
We saw horrible instances of violence. We saw awful instances of human trafficking. We saw awful examples of sexual abuse. And all of this was facilitated by a broken migration system that was broken by the Leader of the Opposition. Now, Speaker, we take a very different approach to the management of this system. We set rules and we make sure that people follow those rules. And the work that the Minister for Immigration and I are doing is imperative. We are assiduously and diligently working through all of the broken aspects of this system and fixing them piece by piece. Yeah, yeah. Now, a really important part of the government's efforts is Operation Inglenook, Speaker, which is an Australian Border Force-led task force which is working around the clock to track down the criminals who have come in across, um, across the borders under those opposite and bringing them to justice. In fact, just weeks after Operation Inglenook was stood up, the leader of a syndicate who was Order. running brothels and his Order. wife fled the country. They Order. fled the country because they knew about the new approach the government was taking. The member and for I can La tell Trobe the parliament that the when they left the country, the what we did was cancel their visas and give them a lifetime ban of ever coming back into our country again. Speaker, Inglenook is absolutely essential and Order, the, the fact that Deacon we had to set it up uh, really demonstrates how poorly this system was being handled. Uh, speaker, we have completely redesigned the work that is Order. done within the Home Affairs Department and I, I want to draw the, the uh, Parliament's attention to one really important fact, which is that under those opposite, immigration compliance officers in our department were cut in half. Cut in half, Speaker. What did they think was going to happen? When you pull resources out of the department, when you pull resources out of ABF, what Order. you find Men is the borders the don't get properly managed. Now, Speaker, we take a very different approach. We're proud of the success that's been done to date, but there is still a hell of a lot more work for us to do. Yeah. The call to the member for Hume. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Analysis of OECD data issued last week shows that under the Albanese Labor government, Australians have experienced a bigger collapse in living standards than any other advanced country. Why are Australians paying the price for a distracted Prime Minister failing to focus on the real issues affecting Australians? Order. The call to the Prime Minister. I thank uh, the Shadow Treasurer for his question. Um, which uh, I'm not sure in what capacity he's asked me, given um, I'm representing. <laughs> given, given, I'm now. But Order. I'm now. I'm now representing Order. the treasurer. Order. So I just thought. I promise to pause I might do him a favour. Order. Members on my left. Me, the member for the member for Gippsland. Order. There is far too much noise. The member for Hume was heard in silence. Order. The member for Hume has asked his question. Order. The same courtesy be shown to the Prime Minister. He has the call. I thought, Mr Speaker, it might be an opportunity for him to get his numbers up of a question to the Treasurer. <laughs> That's all. And it was a missed opportunity, Mr Speaker. Just a missed, op just a missed opportunity. Order. Order. Mr Speaker, what we have done, I've already spoken about the jobs that we have created. Let's compare how our economy, I'm asked about international comparisons of our economy the and how it's Latrobe going. Is now warned. Well, our unemployment rate is 3.6, uh, lower than what we inherited. Our participation rate is 66.7, higher than what we inherited. Our gender pay gap is 13, lower than what we inherited. Women employed full time, 3.8 million, higher than what we inherited. Manufacturing jobs, 948,000, higher than what we inherited. Long term unemployed, 108,000, lower than what we inherited. And industrial disputes, 10,200, days lost uh, over, the, over the quarter up to June, lower than what we inherited. Uh, that is the position that we have uh, presided Member over Casey and, and indeed Fadden something that will, will be in of interest to the former energy minister. Uh, the wholesale electricity prices in September quarter, $63 compared with $264. Compared. Compared. And so we are, we are, of course, the other figure that the shadow treasurer won't want to hear 
is the $22 billion surplus that we produced, as opposed, as opposed to Order. the $78 billion under those opposites. We'll the and they asked, uh, they asked questions about that uh, of uh, the new RBA governor. Order. And this is what she had to say uh, at uh, the estimates uh, just a couple of weeks ago. What we're observing is that we're being assisted by the fact that the government has taken the cyclical benefits of the budget and banked them. She went on to say, I think that's very positive. For us, if it was being spent, that might be an issue, but it's not being spent, it's being banked. So I think that's very helpful. I actually think what they're doing at the moment is good. That was in response to questions from the ever helpful Order. Senator Hume. Senator Hume who complains sometimes that the Senate actually sits. But that was the question from Senator Hume uh, going forward, and that was the response of the RBA governor. Order. I'll hear from the member for Boothby. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to, put to the Minister for Health. After a decade of neglect and cuts to Medicare, how is the Albanese Labor government working to ensure that Australians have access to more bulk bill GP appointments and cheaper medicines? I call to the Minister for Health and Aged Care. I thank, thank you, Speaker. And I thank my friend and electoral neighbour, the member for Boothby, for her question. She had Order. a long career in health care before coming to this place, and she campaigned very hard in Adelaide on a promise to her community to strengthen Medicare. And as a member of this government, she is delivering on that promise in spades. Through our three-point plan to strengthen Medicare, to triple the bulk billing incentive, to roll out a network of Medicare urgent care clinics bulk build clinics, including one in her electorate in Boothby, and of course, Mr Speaker, to make medicines cheaper. The week before last, the member for Boothby joined me at the Castle Medical Centre in Edwardstown in her electorate to announce almost $6 billion of new investments in Medicare that took effect on 1 November, including, of course, the tripling of the bulk billing incentive, the largest investment in bulk billing in the 40-year history of Medicare. Dr Ng told us that 80 per cent of the patients at her centre were either kids, pensioners or concession card holders covered by these new incentives. So from November 1st, Mr Speaker, a bulk billed standard consult at that centre goes up a whopping 34 per cent for all of those patients. 34 per cent. The increase is even higher Deputy in regional Australia, Mr Speaker, with that standard consult going up by as much as 50 per cent. And this is on top of the largest across the board increase to the Medicare rebate that also took effect that day in more than 30 years since Paul Keating was the Prime Minister. A bigger increase this year alone than those opposite managed in six long years in government. We're already receiving reports, Mr Speaker, of practices returning to bulk billing or reaffirming their commitment to stick with bulk billing if they were reconsidering it. The College of General Practice, of course, called this investment a game changer. And it could not be more different, Mr Speaker, to the approach from those opposite, particularly the approach from their leader, a health minister who said it must be remembered that, in his view, there were too many free Medicare services. A health minister who tried to abolish bulk billing altogether and make every single patient pay a fee every single time they visited a doctor, every child, every pensioner, every concession card holder. Order. Well, for Labor, Mr Speaker, bulk billing is the beating heart of Medicare. Yeah. Our historic investment is a huge boost in Order. funding and confidence to the beleaguered general practice sector that was so neglected by the former government. But most importantly, Mr Speaker, it will make it easier and it will make it more affordable for millions of Australians to see their doctor. The call to the I give the call to the order the member for Riverina will just cease that immediately. I give the call to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Prime Minister. Before the last election, the Prime Minister promised real wage increases. But analysis of OECD data shows that in the first 12 months of his government, 
Australian workers have suffered a 5.1 per cent decline in real incomes, the worst in the developed world. Yet again, the Prime Minister has misled the people. Why are Australians paying the price for a distracted Prime Minister failing to focus on the real issues affecting Australians? Give the call order to the Prime Minister. I, 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 I thank uh, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition uh, for her question, notwithstanding the ironic nature of it, because the previous government of which she was a minister for some of the time, and some, some, some of the time not, um, had a deliberate policy, a deliberate policy of driving down wages. That was their deliberate policy. That was part of their economic Order. architecture. Order. The Leader of the Nationals. Economic architecture, deliberate design. So Order. they might have forgotten. They might have forgotten a, a point in the election campaign <laughs> where I was asked whether I would welcome a, a, a one dollar one dollar increase in the minimum wage, a one dollar increase, and I said absolutely. And for days afterwards, for days afterwards, those opposite, those opposite railed about how this would destroy the economy. This would bring everything down. And they thought that was the basis Order. of an election the for campaign is warned. that was held. But not only has that happened once, of course, there's been since then another case in which once again there was a significant increase in the minimum wage. Something that is very important going forward. Now, in terms of Order. in terms of uh, wages as well, we on this side of the house are very proud that for aged care workers, in response to the Aged Care Royal Commission, we have had a 15 per cent, 15 per cent wage increase, wage increase. The member for Hume. For nurses, those people who look after our older Australians and give them the dignity and respect that they deserve. Now, did those opposite, when they received the Royal Commission, do that? No. no. Didn't do it. Didn't do it because they just regarded it as just not a priority. We on this side of the House, we on this side of the House also Order. have the our Prime closing Minister, loopholes Prime bill. Minister will pause. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will state the point of order. Of order on relevance, Mr. Speaker. How can it be in order for the Prime Minister to Resume refer to a seat. previous government when the question? Well, the Prime Minister was asked about election commitments and real wages, and about whether he has delivered on those commitments. Just get the Prime Minister to return to the question. Mr. Speaker, I'm talking about wages. Order. And, and, and we order. have. We have for, for minimum the member workers for, the member for Hume. up nearly three dollars an hour is what we have done. On July 1, 2.4 million workers on awards got a 5.75 per cent pay rise, yeah. the largest increase since 2009. Yeah. But there's legislation before the parliament to stop loopholes, to stop people working side by side, Order. side by side. Side by Order. side, but of course they won't support that because they wouldn't even take action about wage theft. Would not take action Order. about wage Minister's theft time when they has were in government. Concluded. Before I call the member for Benalong, there's far too much noise. The member for Casey and the member for Fadden are now warned. The call to the member for Benalong. My question is to the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. What has been the response to the ongoing consultation on the government's closing loopholes legislation? What obstacles does the government face in closing these loopholes that allow workers to keep being underpaid? I give a call to the Minister for, the, for Employment, Workplace Relations and Minister for the House. The member for Lawler will not interject before a minister speaks. The minister has the call. Thanks, Speaker. And I thank the member for Benelong for the question. Someone has been operating very constructively with the Closing Loopholes Bill. I know you're on the list to speak on it later, later today. Uh, contrast that constructive way of engaging with the manager of opposition business who, earlier today, 
organised a filibuster on his own amendment to prevent it from coming to a vote. Now, I've not seen that before. I've not seen that before, but that's what we had today to prevent his own amendment from coming to a vote. But that same constructive way of engaging that I've referred to for the member for Benelong has been how a whole lot of the employer groups have been engaging as well. And I want to pay tribute to the work of the Australian Hotels Association. And I know the member for Benelong will, be, will have many casuals employed by hotels uh, and organisations that are members of the Hotels Association in the electorate of Benelong. Well, what did uh, Stephen Ferguson have to say? The amendments provide much more certainty and fairness for workers and employers and can be chalked up as a win for both. They strike the right balance. But the Hotels Association isn't the only one that's been engaging positively with the government. I, I've got Order. to say, and the Health Minister I think will agree with me, we, we don't often get the Pharmacy Guild turning up to Labor Party branch meetings. But the Pharmacy Guild has seen the common sense of the amendments that have been negotiated the with respect to casuals and have said the following. The objection. Pharmacy Guild of Australia supports the Albanese government's decision to amend the Closing Loopholes Bill in the interests of both casual employees and employers. Those opposite, those opposite have voted consistently and are doing so again today to delay any provision that is about people being underpaid. Any provision that's about people being underpaid. They want to say they hide behind, oh, we're just wanting to advance the ones about safety. If that was true, why are they not trying to advance the clauses about industrial manslaughter? Is that somehow nothing to do with safety? Do they not understand Order. that labour hire Member workers are Inkler. far much less likely on a mine site? to speak up about safety issues and people who are directly employed. Yep. This government will not say to workers who are being underpaid that their concern is somehow not so controversial. It's a second-rate concern and it's something that we would vote for to delay. We're not going to say to gig workers, you can just wait as long as Member possible before you Christine. have any minimum rates. We're not going to say to the families of people who've died at work that, oh, we'll just delay into the never-never industrial manslaughter. We're not going to say to people who are having their wages deliberately stolen by the employer that it's somehow not urgent or it's too controversial to make wage theft a crime. To the casuals who are working as though they're permanents and just Order. want security, this government will concluded. not the call to the Leader of the Nationals. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, in the past 12 months, sheep prices across the nation have plummeted by up to 70 per cent. Industry confidence has collapsed and farmers are being forced to the wall as a result of the government's amendment, uh, announcement to shut down the live sheep export industry. Did the government undertake any economic modelling on the impact of banning order, live order, sheep exports? Order. There's far too much noise on my right. I'm just going to ask the Leader of the Nationals to state that question. And the member for Fremantle will cease interjecting. I want to make it clear at the beginning of question time this week, no one is to interject during a question. The Leader of the Nationals has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, in the past 12 months, sheep prices across the nation have plummeted by up to 70 per cent. Industry confidence has collapsed and farmers are being forced to the wall as a result of the government's announcement to shut down the live sheep export industry. Did the government undertake any economic modelling on the impact of banning live sheep exports before announcing the shutdown? Give the call to the Prime Minister. Thanks, Mr Speaker. Uh, the contradiction in the Leader of the National Party's question is that he's saying that a foreshadowed policy that hasn't happened has had this massive impact. Has had this massive impact. Order. Because it's not the about. Order. Because, because the it's not about. Prime Minister will pause. The Leader of the Nationals made it clear to the House that he'd be heard in silence and gave him a good go by getting the second question, second reading of the question. I'd, I'd ask the courtesy to be respe respected to the Prime Minister. Order. The Prime Minister has the call. Because price, of course, doesn't go to investment. That's about future. Future. And what we have done, what we have Order. done, what we Order. have done. Order. Is, say that, on my left. is say that uh, we will respond to this in a considered and an orderly way. We appointed a four-person independent panel to consult with farmers, communities, 
supply chain participants to do all of this, to inform when and how uh, this policy could be implemented. That's why uh, we have not, we've very clearly not put a date on, 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 a, uh, on when the phase out uh, will occur. Order. We've said we'll consult with industry in the interests, in the interests of a strong and sustainable future for the Australian sheep, wool and sheep meat industry. And that's one of the things that we've been doing as well. It must be said is to negotiate on behalf of uh, with our, our trading nations in order to in order. in order in order to in order to open up in order to open up further further our exports. Order. Call to the honourable member for McEwen. My question is the Minister for Social Services. How is the Albanese Labor government working for Australian families to help with the cost of living pressure by providing real and immediate support to families, including through the social security safety net? The call to the Minister for Social Services. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for McEwen for his question and for his strong advocacy for so many families and pensioners in his electorate. Of course, our government knows many families are feeling cost of living pressures, and that's why the Albanese Labor government is delivering $23 billion in cost of living relief to make things easier including by strengthening our social security safety net. In my portfolio alone, we are helping families by increasing the maximum rate of rent assistance, expanding the single parent payment and increasing paid parental leave. At the same time, we've listed the base rate of many working age and student payments to provide extra support for those doing it tough. We are providing direct and tangible support to hundreds of thousands of families and pensioners in different settings and different circumstances. And this support is flowing into household budgets now. We have delivered the biggest increase in rent assistance in more than 30 years for around 1.1 million households, including pensioners and families who receive family tax benefit. Now that's more money to help cover the cost of rent. Now, for many families, more rent assistance complements the extra support we're delivering through electricity bill relief, cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines and investment in bulk billing. For single parents who Order. face the difficult Deputy challenge of, work, of balancing work and care on their own, we've extended the eligibility for single parent payment until their youngest child turns 14. This will result in an extra 65,000 single parents being better off by, on average, $170 per fortnight. Now, for the parents of newborns, the government is delivering the biggest investment in paid parental leave since it was introduced in 2011. We've expanded access to more families, including introducing a $350,000 family income limit and made it much easier for both parents to share care. And from 2024, we will expand the scheme by an extra six weeks, reach, reaching six months by 2026. That's over $5,000 extra to help cover time off around the birth of a baby and help juggle work and care. Not only will our investments help families, but it will help participation and productivity, so there is a dividend to the Australian economy as well. Myself and my colleagues in this Labor government are working across government every day to deliver cost of living relief, including through the measures I've outlined. And we will continue to work for Australian families to deliver for them now and into the future. Call to the Leader of the Australian Greens. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Over 11,000 civilians have been killed in the bombing and invasion of Gaza, including over 4,000 children. The government says it's concerned by the number of deaths, but clearly not enough to stop backing the invasion. Prime Minister, what is the number of deaths and how many more children must die before Labor will join France and most of the world in calling for a ceasefire? Call to the Prime Minister. I thank uh, the member for Melbourne for his question. Uh, we have said very clearly that Israel does have a right to defend itself. We have also said that the way that it does matters, and we must distinguish between Hamas 
and Palestinian citizens. And we have said the same thing consistently. I have said the same thing uh, to uh, President Herzog, to Prime Minister Netanyahu, and to the head of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, who I spoke with last week. I have said very clearly that every Israeli and every Palestinian life matters. Yeah, yeah. Everyone, every child, every baby, every innocent civilian. And I say with respect to the member for Melbourne that during this debate, it does not assist, it does not assist to suggest that somehow uh, the government, or indeed any individual, unless you have some basis for it, is dismissive of the loss of life of people in Gaza or in Israel. I have met with the Islamic leadership uh, of this country from right around the, the country. I've met with uh, Jewish community leaders. This is a really difficult time, really difficult. And community cohesion matters. And the attempt to uh, somehow uh, say uh, that you know, Australia is engaged in on-the-ground action almost with some of the comments that you would read is just not accurate and is uh, not appropriate in my view. Uh, we have said uh, that we want uh, humanitarian pauses as a necessary first step. Uh, we've said that any uh, step on a path to ceasefire can't be one-sided. Hamas is still bombing Israel, it's still using human shields, and it's still holding more than 200 hostages. Yeah. I've said really consistently that uh, Hamas has contempt for international law. They're a terrorist organisation. But Israel, as a democratic nation, uh, has a responsibility to uphold international law and protect innocent lives and two, to uh, protect uh, civilians, including children. It's a message I give here. It's a message I give when, I'm, when I've spoken to uh, leaders in those countries as well. Yeah. Yeah. Call to the honourable member for Parramatta. My question is to the Minister for Communications. The Optus network outage last week affected millions of Australians and businesses. What support is available for Australians impacted? And what steps will the Albanese Labor government take in response to the recent outage? The call to the Minister for Communications. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. Last week's Optus network outage impacted some 10 million Australian consumers and businesses across mobile, broadband, and fixed line services underscoring just how essential connectivity is for all Australians. The impacts were felt across the economy and the community, with repercussions for FPOS systems, hospitals and public transport, and consumers and business customers were understandably frustrated. It was not just an inconvenience. For some small businesses, it represented a whole day's trade. And for Australians with a disability, including those relying on internet-assisted technology, the outage would have been deeply distressing. The telecommunications industry ombudsman is available to provide support to consumers and small businesses who are impacted if direct engagement with Optus does not result in a satisfactory outcome. The TIO has useful and clear information on its website that is specifically relevant to this outage. The ACCC also offers information about relevant rights under consumer law. I encourage all members to visit accc.gov.au and tio.com.au and share these important materials with their constituents. Australians expect and deserve better from their communications service providers, and it is essential that we understand what happened, what went wrong, and what improvements can be made by the sector as a whole in order to reduce the risks of a future disruption of this scale reoccurring by any major telecommunications provider. 
That is why, Mr Speaker, I have tasked my department to establish a post-incident review. My department is currently working on the terms of reference and the government will make further announcements in due course. This will include an examination of issues such as the adequacy of regulatory settings to support access to triple zero emergency services amongst other important matters. Importantly, Mr Speaker, independently, the regulator, the Australian Communications and Media Authority has also announced that it has commenced an investigation into Optus's compliance with rules requiring emergency calls to be successfully carried from each telecommunications provider to the emergency call person, who is Telstra. Our government will carefully consider recommendations from the upcoming reviews to ensure the regulatory and policy settings adapt and respond so as to keep Australians safe and reliably connected. The call to the Honourable Member for Wannan. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs. Under the Albanese Labor government, the decision to release 80 hardcore criminals will result in more violent crimes against Australians. Why hasn't this government drafted any legislation to keep Australians safe from these criminals? Order. Give the call. The Minister for Home Affairs and Cybersecurity will cease rejecting. Give the call to the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs. Thank you, Speaker. And I thank the uh, Shadow Minister for his question. Perhaps I can begin by reminding him and all members that on last Wednesday afternoon, the High Court handed down a decision which required the release of an individual from immigration detention. The High Court handed down a decision which we, of course, are complying with. I would say, as any government would, but as we've heard earlier, Order. not every Australian government has complied with the requirements of the law nor respected separation of powers. Right. Can I say this too, Speaker? The Commonwealth argued against the decision ultimately that the High Court maintained. But of course we were prepared, as, as I think the uh, Shadow Minister's question suggests, Order. we were prepared for this outcome because of the significance of this case. Members would appreciate that the case has overturned a precedent of nearly two decades. Throughout this, community safety has been our number one concern. And I say to the Australian community, it will continue to be our number one concern. I hope that that is a concern that is echoed across this chamber and in the other place. To that end, the Australian Federal Police and, of course, the Australian Border Force have been working closely with our state and territory authorities. I might make very clear that that cooperation through the ABF commenced prior to the decision being handed down in recognition of our apprehension of the seriousness of an adverse decision to the Commonwealth. We took those steps in advance of it. We also established a joint operation with state and federal order. The minister will pause, and I'll hear from the member for Wannan. Speaker, on, on relevance, the question was why has the seat. government? Yeah. Yeah. Order. Resume your seat. Order. The member for McEwen will cease interjecting. I wait 18 months for the a question. The minister, minister has the call and will be relevant to the question. This is not serious. This is not serious, and this is a serious issue. We moved quickly to ensure that we issued visas to impacted individuals with appropriate conditions to ensure that community safety can be upheld, including requirements to report regularly to the department to inform the minister of any changes of personal details, address, social media profiles, restrictions of industries on employment and a range Order. of other strict conditions. This is in addition to state and territory requirements which go to the issues that you were talking about, Shadow Minister. Now, we have been required to release people almost instantly. That is the decision of the court. But we continue to consider all measures that may be available to strengthen our protection of the community. And I note, of course, that we are yet to have the reasons for the court's decision. 
we have been approaching this issue in anticipation of a decision because we regard community safety seriously. We continue to do so, unlike members Order. opposite, whose record in this area is an unmitigated disaster. Yeah. Give a call to the member for McNamara. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Cyber Security. Following the cyber attack on DP World last week, how is the Albanese government taking action to uplift the cyber security of Australia's critical infrastructure? I give a call to the Minister for Home Affairs and the Minister for Cyber Security. Thank you so much, Speaker. Uh, in my role as Minister for Cyber Security, I'm not always able to get up and deliver positive news to the parliament, but we do have good news today. Uh, this afternoon, DP World announced that they are resuming operations at their facilities. Their expectation is that 5,000 containers will leave their ports today. Yeah. Speaker, the incident at DP World is the latest in a string of cyber attacks which have shaken our country. Uh, and this is why this is such a central priority for our government. Yeah. The DP World incident also, Speaker, shows that some of the critical reforms that our government has put in place in the past 18 months are actually working. Uh, Speaker, for many Australians, they're probably not really conscious of the tremendous complexity that's involved in managing a cyber incident of this size. In the case of DP World, we have a company here that manages 40 per cent of freight movements in and out of our country. The implications for a shutdown, even briefly, on the ports are very widespread, affecting most of the parts of the Australian economy. Speaker, in the instance of this particular cyber attack, we had the National Cyber Security Coordinator who was on the ground effectively immediately working with the company and across industries to help manage the impacts of this. The National Coordination Mechanism, which was triggered for the first time by our government in the context of the Optus attack, has been meeting daily to manage the impacts of this uh, serious incident. And they've been able to also coordinate the Australian Cyber Security Centre in its engagement in the company, with the company and the Australian Federal Police. Now, Speaker, it's really important for the parliament to understand that none of these mechanisms would have been possible without the reforms of our government and under the former government. Uh, but, Speaker, we're not satisfied with clearing what has been an impossibly low bar set by those opposite in <laughs> cyber security. Uh, let's remember, Speaker, Order. that they didn't even have a cyber security Order. minister. I mean, let's pause on that point for a moment. We've dealt with a lot of cyber incidents in the last 18 months. They didn't even have a minister who was clearly in charge of these issues. Now, Speaker, we have implemented enormous reform in the 18 Order. months that we've been in government. We have declared 168 critical infrastructure assets of systems of national significance. We've commenced a very substantial, very important set of national cyber exercises which help us flex and build that muscle. And indeed, Speaker, today the government made two announcements about policy reforms that will be contained in the forthcoming national cyber security strategy. One of those is to introduce mandatory reporting requirements for ransomware attacks around Australia. And the second is to lift the requirements that we place on telecommunications companies to make sure that those telcos that can do so much to affect the cyber security of every citizen in our country are meeting their responsibilities. Speaker, we've got a big mess to clean up here, but there's lots of work underway and I'm proud of the work that's been done so far. Yeah, yeah. Give the call to the honourable member for Fowler. Give the call to the member for Fowler. Thank you, Speaker. Prime Minister, families are paying over $2 per litre at the pump today, which is increasing costs and inflation across the supply chain. It's one of the reasons interest rates have increased, which is hurting working Australians immensely. Fuel prices will go up and down, but a cut to fuel excise would lower costs and reduce inflation now. Why won't the government reduce the fuel excise at a time it has a budget surplus and provide instant cost of living mortgage relief to families, especially in Western Sydney? Call to the Prime Minister. I thank the member for Fowler for her question, and I certainly acknowledge uh, that so many people, including in her electorate, are doing it tough at the moment, and as a result of a range of factors, not the least of which is uh, what has happened with oil, uh, with uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but also we know Order. that the Middle East crisis. Order. Members on my left. The member for O'Connor. That the Middle East crisis, which is being undertaken at. Order. Members on my left. The member for O'Connor is warned, and if he interjects one more time, he'll leave the chamber. 
Prime Minister, we heard in silence. We inherited, of course, uh, when we came to office, the decision uh, of the former government that they, they put in their budget in March of 2022 uh, that they had a limited time of a pause on fuel indexation. Uh, they put that limited period on there because uh, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, the issue of, of uh, petrol indexation, one of the concerns uh, that is there in the economy and including from the Reserve Bank that feeds into, feeds into interest rates is how much cash there is in the economy uh, as well. So we have, we have purposefully targeted cost of living relief uh, through the increase in payments which the Minister for Social Services spoke about earlier today. Order. From the Minister for Order. Health the member for Casey. has spoken about today with cheaper medicines and the bulk billing uh, tripling of the incentive. We have very consciously targeted the relief at families through childcare relief as well. Uh, so we will always look at Order. measures to. The Prime Minister will pause. There's far too much noise. The member for Fowler, on a point of the Prime Minister, has concluded his answer. Oh. Order. The member for Morton has the call. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Following the Prime Minister's visit to China and attendance at the Pacific Islands Forum. What are some of the outcomes of these engagements that will make a positive difference for Australia's economy and security? Give the call to the Prime Minister. I, I thank the member for Morton uh, for his question. And we know that the world is confronting serious challenges and economic headwinds, and that what happens internationally matters at home. And crucial that Australia takes our seat at the table and speaks up for our interests. That's how we get results for Australians. Uh, we know that for jobs, for trade, for the economy and security, it matters, that engagement. And that's why I was pleased to be the first Australian PM to visit China since 2016. This is one of our most important relationships. Uh, more than one in four of Australia's export dollars derives from the relationship with China. And indeed, more than one in four of Australia's jobs depend upon trade. We have been patient, calibrated and deliberate in our approach to this relationship, and it's already paying dividends. Uh, removing of trade impediments on timber, coal, barley, hay and a range of other products. A path forward for wine exports from Australia. Between January and August this year, and there's been a huge bump since then, uh, Australia exported $6 billion of the products that had impediments placed on them to China. If we compare that, it was $85 million in the same period last year. $85 million up to $6 billion. And it's no wonder the National Party are so pleased Order. about this as well, because it's had a particular impact in regional Australia. When I was in Port Lincoln, they were already signing deals on barley, and barley is already in China from Australia making a difference. And the wine industry, of course, has had bumper crops uh, that is sitting there waiting to be exported, and already there are negotiations on deal there. And I look forward to the removal of any of the impediments uh, across the board. Now, the visit to the Cook Islands was also important that we engage with our Pacific neighbours. Uh, we know what happened with security arrangements uh, during the last government. Well, our government has, uh, has reached out and uh, ensured uh, that we are uh, involved in securing peace and stability in the region. And the bilateral agreement as a result of Tuvalu's approach, the Fallopilly Union, is a Tuvalu in word for the traditional values of good neighbourliness, care and mutual respect. It's a bilateral treaty that will come before this parliament <coughs> dealing with climate change, including disaster assistance and coastal adaptation, special mobility pathway to enable an initial cap of 280 people per year, but importantly as well, security agreement 
a mutual agreement on any arrangement or engagement with any other state or entity on security and defence related matters in Tuvalu. Very important for Australia's security.